Thank you for joining us today for the Young Professionals Learning Community. Just a quick disclaimer that this presentation was prepared for the Pacific Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center under a cooperative agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. All of the material appearing in this presentation um, that has taken directly from copyrighted sources is in the public domain and may be reproduced or copied without permission from SAMHSA or the authors. Citation of the source is appreciated. I am the Youth Program Director at Youth Move National, uh, as well as the Project Director for our Peer Center. Um, and I also serve as the Youth and Young Adult Specialty Lead for uh, the Pacific Southwest MHTTC. And my name is Joshua Calarino. Uh, I'm located in Miami, Florida, and I'm here to assist Kristen with my uh, experience as the Youth Program Specialist here at Youth Move National and other uh, job duties, including training coordination, peer evaluation, uh, and even winning an award from SAMHSA for young adult uh, youth advocacy. So what do we mean when we say person-centered? Um, there's also, I mean, per person-centered, individualized, patient-centered, you know, they're all kind of interchangeable. Um, but what that means is that service recipients have control over their services, including the amount, the duration, the scope of care, um, and what providers they choose to work with. Um, person-centered care also is respectful and responsive to the culture, linguistic, and other social and environmental needs of the individual. Um, so person-centered care is really a way of thinking and doing things that sees people using health and social services as equal partners in planning, developing, and monitoring care uh, to really make sure it's meeting their needs. This also means putting people and their families at the center of decisions and seeing them as experts working alongside professionals to get the best possible outcome. And it's not really about just giving people whatever they want um, or just providing information. It's really about considering people's desires, their values, their family situations, their social circumstances and lifestyles, um, and seeing that person as an individual and working together to develop appropriate solutions. Um, it's also about being compassionate and thinking about things from the person's point of view and being respectful um, as well. Uh, and this might be shown through um, sharing decisions with um, young people and helping them to manage their health. But it's it's not just about activities. It's it's really about the way in which uh, providers and other professionals um, think about care and their relationships um, as the actual services available. Providing person-centered care really you know provides better care and it leads to better health. Um, research has found that person-centered care can have a big impact on the quality of care. Um, it can improve the experience people have of care and help them feel more satisfied. It can encourage people to lead a more healthy lifestyle. It can encourage people to be more involved in um, decisions and choices about their care. It can impact their uh, health outcomes. So for example, blood pressure. Um, it also reduces the unnecessary use of services. So if a person, particularly a young person, is feeling engaged and heard and validated in their care, um, they're going to get the most benefit from it. And finally, it really improves how confident and satisfied professionals themselves are um, and how they feel about the care that they're offering. What does it look like to build collaborative relationships and what does that look like in practice for you it really is about respecting people's values um, it's about taking into account people's preferences and expressed needs it's coordinating and integrating care so making sure people do have access um, as you said josh to a network of supports um, both in terms of people within, uh, you know, natural supports, as well as, you know, community-based services or programming that's going to support their wellness. Um, it's about working together to make sure there's good communication and information and education. 
It's also about making sure that people are physically comfortable and safe. So kind of that trauma-informed principle of safety. Um, you know, it is hard to engage in services uh, if you're not feeling safe, both emotionally um, as well as physically. Person-centered care also offers emotional support. Um, and it, involve, it, it involves um, friends and family. Um, if the young person wants, right? And that's part of a part of being person centered is is um, ensuring that a young person is really driving their process. Um, it's about making sure sure that there's continuity between and within services, and making sure that people have access to appropriate care when they need it. Um, so, like I said, both of you touched on a lot of those um, those themes. So shared decision-making is one framework that can support the, um, the you know, proper implementation of person-centered care. And shared decision-making is really a process that promotes the selection of a treatment choice that is based on both relevant evidence and the preferences of a young person. And at its core, it's the principle that self-determination, so, um, that the young person is able, that they're willing, and that they're allowed to make their own decisions um, is a desirable goal and outcome and one that young people should be supported to achieve. Um, as I said, we really want young people to be driving their care, um, whether that's in a peer support relationship, um, whether it's in a you know, clinical relationship with a psychiatrist or a therapist, or a social worker or case management, like we really want young people to be identifying and um, driving their, the goals that they set for themselves. Image and graphic comes from a resource that is in the resource slide. And I thought it was really interesting how, um, how this is framed in terms of like what is needed in order for um, shared decision-making and person-centered care to happen. And really it's about, um, you know, a clinician or provider, they use the term clinician. I can say provider because maybe you're a peer provider or maybe you work within a drop-in center or Anna, like you working in a, a substance use recovery space, um, really providing evidence and communication, knowledge and skills that the young person is also equally contributing um, in terms of individual characteristics and needs, their personal preferences and values, and both need a belief in the benefit of shared decision-making, um, a willingness to participate in the process, and acknowledgement that the current preferences are at least partially uninformed. Um, and the next slide will talk a little bit about that uninformed piece. So, you know, to be carried out effectively, shared decision-making relies on a number of factors related to the provider and the young person as um, depicted and just discussed um, from the graphic on the slide. And really the most important requirement is a good relationship between the provider and young person. So if you're not able to communicate openly with one another, and Josh, you spoke to this, right? Like relationship building is such a key part of any work that you do together. Um, it's, you know, if you don't have good communication, it's unlikely um, that a proper, shared decision-making process can take place. It also requires buy-in by um, you know, providers, by agency leadership um, and other services to be, to, you know, to be person-centered, um, including the benefits of you know, shared decision-making and commitment to all aspects of the, of the process. And finally, effective um, shared decision-making requires willingness and ability on the part of the young person to participate. So it's important to note that both of these attributes may need to be cultivated by the provider, um, as many young people may be initially reluctant to take part of, um, in the decision-making process or may not fully understand the ways in which they can be involved. Um, and I think that's something that's a really important point is that we often um, make assumptions about, you know, whether we know best for a young person or um, thinking that they can't be involved because they don't know about the process, but really a big part of our role in working with young folks is to give them the information they need. So one of the key parts of doing that is, is what that 
the resource that I referenced in that graphic is they call activation. Um, so in order for young people to contribute to the process, they need to have the skills um, to allow them to be empowered to actually, you know, meaningfully engage. So this process of activation is perhaps one of the most important features that distinguishes a shared um, decision making process from simple like collaboration to like a full on process and activation acknowledges that young people at the beginning might not necessarily have already have the experience or skills um, to make informed decisions about certain aspects of their care. But even if you aren't offering clinical services, you can still really support a young person in building the skills to find and evaluate information um, so that they're able to advocate for themselves both within treatment and outside of it. Um, so some of the skills that the activation process tries to cultivate in young people are um, you know, how to ask questions about their treatment and whatever mental health challenge they're experiencing how to seek out information. So part of, you know, information being a broadly used term here, it could be resources, you know, doing some community mapping within their community, uh, their community, um, any kind of thing, but like, how do you help them find the resources and information they need to better understand their care, to better understand what they're experiencing? Um, and then how to evaluate that information, uh, particularly regarding their treatment options and decisions. So, you know, maybe they, you need to provide them support and understanding what some of the different treatment options are and teaching them how to, um, you know, as I said, evaluate that information so that they're making a really informed choice. Help them to discuss treatment options with their providers. So again, that like kind of self-advocacy um, piece and that really includes being able to question the reasoning behind decisions. So maybe, you know, maybe their provider says, we really think you should be on medications and maybe the young person is resistant to that um, and, and not really feeling like that's what they wanna do. And so, uh, you know, providing them the, the space and the skills to be able to push back and say, I'm not sure I wanna be on medication and why do you think I need to be on medication and what are the possible alternatives? Um, activation also um, is about, you know, supporting them in learning to communicate their needs, their values and preferences to their team members so that they're able, again, to have like the best possible outcome and the best possible experience in care. So while there are a number of models that um, can really guide the implementation of shared decision making, um, they all include sort of the following core stages. There's a two-way exchange of information between a provider and a young person. There's deliberation, so really intentional, thoughtful um, conversation um, around the information that's being provided. There's a selection of an option that's consistent with the values and preferences of the, of the youth. So again, the youth is sort of driving their process. And then finally, there's time taken to review um, whatever choice is made. Some steps you can take to implement shared decision making is to explain the process, provide education to improve mental health literacy. So I think that's such an important thing um, now more than ever is helping young people to understand um, you know, what they're going through and what their peers are going through. Um, and again, what's available to support them and to help young people explore possibilities, including how their mental health challenges might be managed or treated. You know, asking young people if they feel like they have enough information to make a choice, right? Like we need, let's ask them before we move into a decision-making process, like do they feel like they're there yet or do we need more to, you know, gather more information or are there more things that we need to um, input. We also want to ask young people if they're feeling pressured to make a particular choice. So again, we know this happens particularly in, um, you know, team-based or collaborative multidisciplinary approaches, you know, like a caregiver often wants something different than a young person um, or, um, you know, a, a family peer might have different thoughts than a youth peer. So 
you know, really ensuring that whatever choice is being made by a young person um, is not one that they're feeling pressured or, or coerced into and that they're really doing it of their own will because they think it's gonna be the best thing to, to support their recovery. And then you wanna make a choice, right? After, after determining all of the above, you know, make a choice together. And then you review that progress um, and you adjust as needed, right? Like if you make a choice, you test it out, um, see if it's working and if it's working, great. But if you need to make some minor adjustments, that's okay too. With this slide, as you can see, it's a discussion around developmental relationships frame, framework, which you can spend a lot of time learning about. So we're just gonna sort of briefly discuss them. And if you want to, you can sort of take your own time to maybe learn a little bit more. With that being said, uh, in developmental relationships frameworks, you want to express care. You want to show the young person that they matter to you. You want to challenge growth, meaning we want youth to grow. Typically, you don't grow unless you are sort of made to do so. You are given a situation, you are pushed, right? You need to make a change. If you, we challenge growth and allow youth the space to be in a, a, in a growth zo zone, where they are able to flex their muscles, but not too much as they get to a place of, of fear. That's how we can challenge growth. You provide support. So yes, we want to challenge them. We want them to be able to grow and shift and change, but that doesn't happen in a vacuum. Supports need to be made in place uh, when that happens. You want to share power, right? Equal decision-making process as much as you have, uh, as much as you can rather, uh, to be able to have both parties be as educated as possible, because as we all know, knowledge is power, and you want to expand opportunities. So you want to make it so that youth have as many options as possible. If they want to lead the meeting, if they want to have a discussion, if they want to X, Y, and Z thing, provide opportunities for those spaces to be created, to be crafted, and to be upheld uh, when the youth get around that. But really, though, uh, above all, you really want to express care. With that being said, I do want to take a little bit of time to maybe explain this a touch more. This comes from the Search Institute, and the Search Institute reminds us that young people are more likely to grow up successfully when they experience developmental relationships with important people in their lives. So yes, that means like therapists, that means clinicians, that means peer, but remember that it didn't just describe those people. Important people can also be friends, families, parents, mothers, cousins, right? Whoever they might choose, those people also matter as well. So this can be something to think about with that framework of everyone in that network, like I mentioned earlier, being involved. Developmental relationships are close connections through which young people discover who they are, cultivate abilities to shape their own lives, and learn how to engage with and contribute to the world around them. We're going to just I'm going to just provide some further examples of what this might look like. So that can look like when you're with when you're in a developmental relationship with someone being dependable right being someone that the youth can trust is important seeking to understand right work to understand young people their backgrounds and points of views when they share ideas and that includes things like asking questions expect their best their best there are a lot of expectations that are placed on youth that say oh the youth may not be able to do this may not be able to do that no Expect their best. Expect youth and young adults to live up to their potential. Uh, challenge them to think differently by asking hard questions, providing alternate explanations, and encouraging openness uh, and different opinions, uh, two different opinions, rather. Uh, that will help them build new skills and expand their own thinking, right? getting that challenging growth that I mentioned earlier. You want to navigate 
guide youth through hard situations and systems. The work that we do is not particularly simple work. A lot of work goes into it. A lot of pieces are moving around it. So being a navigator through that can be important and empowering youth by creating space for youth and young adults to discover and use their power uh, really, really help with this. And like we mentioned, right, offer support when young adults face challenges. If needed, you can ask a trusted adult to be an ally and a resource through that process. And we can also, to get a little more complex, shift levels of support. Give more support when young people are struggling and less when they are making progress. Step back as their own skills and confidence build. Right. So the example that I'd like to use for this would be the idea if you have a youth who needs if you have a total of need, let's say, and you put that into people need 10 units of this need. Right. 10 need units. If one youth needs if one youth has seven rather and another youth has three, clearly one youth needs more than the other. But if you give them both the maximum amounts of like 30 that you can give, then they never really build skills on their own. You kind of want to get them to that 10. You want to right, support them and then take a step back to allow their leadership skills and their own potential grow in those spaces. And you want to uh, inspire inspire youth and young adults to see possibilities in their future. Hope is a major driving force um, of humanity as a whole. So being able to inspire hope in others really can uh, assist in that process. Um, model being a curious leader by asking questions and sharing what you're learning in your own life. Take turns with youth doing things like trying new food, music, or outings based on each other's interests potentially. Introduce young adults to people who can help them learn new things about things that interest them. And that's just a little touch on the idea of developmental relationships frameworks that we can talk about right now. With that, if I could have the next slide. So we have a small activity here. We're going to be sort of like a role play, a little food for thought, whatever you want to describe this as. So Audrey recently had an episode of psychosis. She's in her senior year of high school, and the voices she's hearing has, have really impacted her ability to study. As part of her treatment, she has been prescribed antipsychotic medications. She's recently confided to you, to us, that she has not been taking her medication because of the side effects make her feel sleepy and lethargic all of the time. And obviously you'd be concerned about her and maybe think that she should be on her medications. So in this case, what do you do? And what approach would you take to address the issue? Asking those probing questions, like, what do you think? That reminds me of the language that I've heard before saying like playing the tape. Right. Like if if we do step off of taking medication, do that, what do you think might happen? But of course, as with any tape, you can also rewind. Right. Like you mentioned, what has happened before? Uh, and one thing that you can't do with the tape, but you can do as a person is think about uh, that that future. Like, what will this result to? And maybe think about what are the paths that we can take to lead to the best solution? And I think, again, that's right, providing opportunities for different methods, right? Empowering the youth to be able to make their own decision, but also providing support and alternatives and, and challenging them to see where this might lead. So I think in what you said, a lot of that was there. So uh, thank you for jumping in and sharing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think another thing, too, is thinking about, again, like thinking back to sort of person-centered, patient-centered care, um, really providing information, so more information. So, okay, like you shared with me that this particular medication side effects kind of feel like a deal breaker for you. They really are um, too much and they're, they're impa negatively impacting your, you know, kind of quality of life. But maybe saying, you know, that's great. Um, thanks for sharing with me. Maybe we can look into some other options, right? Like maybe we can explore what other medications, like trial and error, um, 
or maybe you should, you know, if you're a peer provider and you're not one, the one who's responsible for their prescriptions, you know, you can explore with them how they might approach their psychiatrist or, um, you know, general practitioner or whoever they're, they're getting prescriptions from to, to feel comfortable going to them and saying this medication is not working for me and I would like to advocate for something else. Um, so again, they're able to explore what other options. Maybe there's another medication that might cause a little bit less sleepiness um, or maybe there are other treatment options that might be available. So, um, you know, working with whatever young person, in this case, it's Audrey, <laughs> um, you know, to, to build up their skills, you know, as, you know, in terms of the developmental relationships framework, really asking them to challenge themselves um, and, and really grow in, in that self-advocacy piece of being able to go back. Are there barriers that may impact collaborations and that shared decision-making process? And how can we address and overcome those barriers? And, and just while, you, while we all think about that answer, we work and we think about things simply like in the best case there. So we, we've talked about it like, yeah, you know, you're patient, you're kind, you're all of these things. But in reality, right, in practice, things are not always so simple. So what are both those very small things that impede uh, collaboration and maybe also the very big things in that as well. Um, so thanks for so much for attending.